Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Comedy Clubhouse Schoolhouse, and we're going to teach you today how to write a good roast joke. We have joining us James Regal, who is a <laughs> co-producer of the Roast Battle International Barcelona, Tamar Catan, one of the Hello. Foremost, foremost comedians in the entire fucking world. Uh, there, I you, said man. it. Thank you. That's just and then uh, John Ellis, who's a piece of shit. So I'm here you. to learn, guys. I'm, I want to <laughs> listen. John and I are, are roasting each other on uh, on Thursday, which is tomorrow night, and we can we can use each other as examples. Nothing that we write here will probably be good enough for tomorrow night anyway. But so let's go. Okay, so. Let's... What's the, like the, the first step is like research, right? So, so I kind of want to understand when I when I make it to the big leagues. So I've flown out to LA. What's what's my process with the other guy? You you, you meet with them. What kinds of information do you want to extract from them? Yeah, it's almost like a date. You know, how are you? What's been good in your life? What's been bad in your life? Mm -hmm. What's been challenging? Um, what scares you? I usually, there's four main emotions that you, you write through, which is what's hard about something, what's scary about something, what's weird about something, and what bugs me about something. And when I ask questions during a roast battle lunch, I ask through the lens of those four emotions, mm -hmm. because those are the emotions that you write jokes through. You know what I mean? Like if someone's like, you know what makes me really happy? You never have a joke that goes, you know what makes me really happy? Because <laughs> uh, happiness doesn't work in comedy. Unless it's comedy. kicking children. It has to, and, you have yeah, to but then turn it yeah, with exactly. Exactly. Really yeah, mean. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But, um, so that's, that's usually how I start my research. Mm -hmm. And then I try to keep it casual too. My main thing is making the person forget that I'm trying to extract jokes <laughs> so that they get really relaxed. The people kind of clam up a lot. The people sort of... <clears throat> no, it's cool because really we just go, let's just have a good time. Mm -hmm. Let's just go. It's not necessarily like I got my piece of paper in front of me and I'm asking... I, actually, I did do that the first time, admittedly. I had a piece of paper and it went down and I noticed the person gave me very short answers. The next time, I was just super casual about it. Okay. And we just had a, a date, practically. Where we just sat and had a conversation and and I asked them questions that I didn't know about them and I genuinely just got to know that person better. Do you look for stuff that will hurt them? No. No, cuz you never know. Like um some sometimes they'll share that. You know what I mean? And that will come out, but I don't necessarily intrinsically look for that. What do you think about that as a roast topic though because I think people have made the mistake that like the point of a roast is to hurt the feelings of the other person so you go after the thing that hurts them the most in the case of Pete Davidson you'd talk about his dad dying in 9-11 or you know yeah I don't think that I don't mm. think that's what it's really about I think I don't it, think but, so either but I yeah. think that's the common mistake some, yeah, but, but also like Pete Pete Davidson does material about his dad dying in 9-11 right yeah. so you're not necessarily saying anything that would surprise Pete Davidson and I do you're not trying to hurt their feelings but the people that take like battling and winning really seriously, they what they I think they are trying to do is write something so brilliant and scathing that it like it shocks the other person into like they can't help but laugh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're not upset, but they're like, oh my god, I never thought of myself like that, or oh my god, that's that's just yeah. that's yeah. so brutal. It's hilarious because you're trying to win, right? Mm. And you want the audience to, to 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 follow you on that. You know what's funny? I'll tell you. Sometimes I'm not even trying to win. Like I think roast battle is a lot like MMA fights in Japan. The Japanese don't care about your record. They, they care about how you fight. And like for, for me, when I'm roast battling people, like my main thing is, is it funny? Like if, if I go, oh shit, is that too dark? I go, what, well, is it funny? Yeah. And then it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. I saw a roast uh, yeah. on the internet that bombed super, super hard, but someone was roasting Steve-O on one of these mm. celebrity roasts. And the, and the joke was about how they wished that it had been Steve-O that died. Amy instead Schumer. Of, yeah. Instead of Ryan Dunn. <laughs> oh yeah. God, yeah, and yeah, it was yeah. Just That's like, great. Yeah. Dead silence because yeah. like, the the funniness didn't outweigh the, sure. the the level of meanness that was, yeah. that yeah. was brought, and it was clearly a limit for him that was like yeah. way over the line. I guess. Yeah. On your, was um... he laughing or how did he react? No, he didn't, he, laugh. He didn't laugh at all. Oh, he just, like, shook okay. His head he's just like, like, yeah. Well, nah. Steve O's not really a stand up. I'm yeah. sorry <laughs> to say that he's he's a clown and he's extremely skilled as a clown, but he's not really a stand up, and he doesn't come from stand up culture. He became famous first. Mm -hmm. and then entered comedy it's almost like moving to america after you were an immigrant in a different country you don't really feel american and that's why steve-o to me doesn't feel like a stand-up and why he doesn't get that like yeah. i i think i think it's another part of our responsibility especially in a city like barcelona where we're educating people to go hey this is a safe space to say horrible things and and at the end of it we're all gonna hug yeah. and then I, I think it's important when people are roasting you that you show that you're, you're, you're enjoying it and you're having a good time because it teaches the audience 
not just for roast battle, but for all shows. For that life. Jokes are just jokes. How so to take a like, joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's so important. As a roaster then, because we were talking before about how, you, you know, you warn the audience that you might be sexist or racist or whatever towards the other person. You try and pre- prep the audience for it. Yeah. But the audience might just not be there. They might not sure. be ready for you to, to just go yeah. on this tirade. Well, there's got to be a punchline. Right. You know, I think the only times I've seen even a great audience where Roast Battle didn't work or a Roast Battle joke didn't work is when the punchline wasn't good. The joke wasn't good. So for me, the priority is, is it funny? Okay. It's got to be funny. The allegiance, because it, it can be funny to the other comedian, but not necessarily funny to everyone in the audience. Well, you know, so your allegiance in this case should be to comedy. To the audience. The audience. To, to the audience. It's got to be funny to the audience. That's a great point. Like you can't, it is a, a dangerous thing to make it too inside joke. Mm-hmm. Because then the audience feels left out, especially in an yeah. international even more competition so, like yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. Well, this even was, more so now. This was have... my mistake roasting Matt last time because I, I I felt like it was more interesting to ro- uh, to do more sort of personal jokes. Sure, but I ended up having to, having to explain them for a long time beforehand. Yeah, and you yeah. lose, lose a bit mm. of the momentum. So that's, yeah. Well, I mean, like, that's, what, what, that's the other thing about roast jokes is they got to be short and tight. Mm-hmm. My first thing, the first thing I do when I write roast jokes is I'm a big believer in write fat, edit skinny. So I'll write down the roast jokes on a sheet of paper and I'll make like a space in between each joke. And then the first thing I do after I write all the jokes is I, I e- eliminate words that are unnecessary. Mm-hmm. Like comedy's black and white. Anything that's gray, I eliminate. If like, instead of sometimes I go, he always does this. Instead of, oh, this could be, I go, this is. Like, it's comedy's the black and white. If it's, gr- if it's gray, they, they won't laugh. So the first thing I do is eliminate any unnecessary words. He's not, he doesn't sometimes get drunk. He gets drunk. He's not, uh, uh, you know, um, very loving. He's loving. You know what I mean? You're also eliminating uncertainty with this. Yeah. It's, it, that's interesting. It's a great piece of advice, by the way. I've seen, um, just on the stuff about the funny stuff about people, I've also seen great roasts where they've said stuff which is clearly untrue, but could be true by yeah. looking at them, right? So um, one of the roasts I saw in Edinburgh uh, between Ken Grinnell and Alex Haddo. Ale- so Ken Grinnell is, is mixed race. Um, I think his family is like Jamaican and Irish. Alex Haddo is blonde, white from Manchester, British as it's come. And he just kept saying she was a massive racist. And he had this joke, the one that it was his last joke and the room just went absolutely wild. And he, he said something like, Alex is so racist. And everyone's like, how racist is she? So Perfect. She, she barebacks black guys just so she can terminate their babies. Right. <laughs> and the whole room exploded. And like people bent up. And that's like, obviously like not in the slight. She's not a racist. She probably doesn't do that. Doesn't Nothing abort bad. babies for fun. Huh? No, but he'd set up this whole like running joke of she's a racist, which knew like it's funny because it's not true. If you know what I mean? Yeah. So that, yeah. that's like almost like advanced roasting. Um, I also find just just the other thing, like finding stuff about people, but you always got to remember is this is a person stood in front of an audience that perhaps they're seeing for the first time. And there are things about their appearance that are just clearly obvious to anyone. Yeah. And like, so sometimes going for that is just the most simple and best thing because it's like, like any joke where you, if you see, if you make an observation and everyone goes, oh yeah, that's, you know, I was, I was, I was thinking. He does that. look like a lesbian. Yeah, exactly. Was, like, but you can't make all the jokes like that. No, like, certainly not. I think the, just the first the, one. Yeah, exactly. But it, that is also one of the pitfalls is. People, like if someone is overweight, then all your jokes are about the person being fat or if someone's black. It's all about being black or if someone's white. It's all about being white. And I, I think that's where even the judges at like the comedy store, the judges to be like, hey, you just made a bunch of the same jokes. Yeah. And that's not that's the, and, and this is celebrating great like joke writing. Yeah. But there so, is something to be said about getting the audience on your side that way. Hugely valuable. Like Frank Castillo did this great thing with Matt Broussard, similar situation where Matt is, it looks like a Ken doll, right? Like really good looking guy. And Frank goes, his opening joke was, um, Matt Broussard is, what did he write? He goes, uh, Matt is a lot like the food at my work, he's about to get served by a Mexican. Uh, <laughs> is that right? About to get served by a Mexican. Yeah. And it's short, it's tight, it got the audience on his side immediately, and Matt was in trouble from that point forward. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that is one of my questions, is how the first joke should differ from the last joke. So what, what mm. the escalation of jokes should be. That's a great question, because it's like a lot of people, uh, I think it should build and build and build. Like and, if you've got a joke that's, that's your, I think you close with your biggest joke and you 
I open with my second biggest. Right. People will flip flop those sometimes. Okay. I think closing is how they're going to remember you most. That joke is going to be the the last joke before the judges judge. Okay. Uh, the first joke is going to be your first impression. So I kind of flip back and forth between my biggest joke, either being my opener or my closer. But the, presumably the first joke, it's kind of like the wrestling thing we were talking about the other day, how to roast and, and wrestling. Um, but the first joke probably is something that should be obvious to everybody, right? Should be kind of a bit more like this guy looks like this. Maybe. Yeah, I think it could be. I, it's hard to tell unless I'm looking at the jokes, because sometimes there's jokes that are really personal, like that joke I did about Jay uh, breaking up with his girlfriend, but they still live together. That's much more personal, but it worked as an opener. John, why don't you tell us what your first joke is? Uh, I haven't written any jokes uh, for sure yet. I just want, I wanted to check first if you have any limits, anything I shouldn't be uh, getting into. I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've been mentally preparing myself, trying to think of like what, what tracks you're going to take on me and what, you know, what I can withstand. I, th- I feel confident in being able... I'm able to take a lot of shit. Can I talk about your divorce? Yeah. Oh yeah. Can and you can you send me the poem that she wrote? Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Tamara, do you know about this? I don't. My ex wife sent me a video last year. She was like, Hey, I made this dance. I'm a choreographer. I made this dance about a relationship. Oh, can I share it with no you? No way. And I said, Oh big absolutely. Oh my god, you're sharing your art. Of course I wanna see it. And she sends me the video and it opens up and she's like alone in this field, uh, where I proposed actually. And uh, it, she starts moving her body. She goes, you're the one who taught me that the person you love most in the world can lie to your face. <laughs> and then it just fucking tears me apart from there. On. Wow. And it's like, oh, somebody's not, somebody but, else is not over this while yet. doing an interpretive dance. Yes, the <laughs> entire <laughs> time. And, it wasn't uh, very interpretive if she had to speak the words at the same time. Yeah, that's, though, right? that's probably true. You oh, were married God. to Lady Napoleon Dynamite. Oh, that's my goodness. Crazy. And then uh, she posted it online. I, I realized that she sent it to me not to because she wanted to share. She wanted to warn me that she's going to post this. And her yeah. family's just like, way to turn grief into a gift. You go, girl. You're amazing. I'm like, <laughs> half of that shit was not even true. Wait, do I know this person? Yeah. Uh, no, you don't. Okay. Fine. No, no. Her, her name's Zoe. She's a beautiful woman. She lives in New York City. And great dance. Answer. Great dance. Yeah. <laughs> honest to God. She's incredibly talented. Uh, one of the smartest ladies I know. Yeah. Very lovely. But that's, that's, and an, a complete cunt. <laughs> but that's an interesting point because that's like a whole yarn to, that's a really funny thing to maybe target them on, on, on right? But like, sure. Th- it's, it would be quite a long setup to explain, like, yeah. you were married and she's a dancer. And she's, so it's like, how do you. Can you break that up over multiple jokes? Yeah. How do you yeah. Or, that? or how do you, yeah, condense the setup into like, this, you know, it's the, the, the rhythm of like, Matt was married and da 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 Stop punchline. Like, I think that's how I would do, do a it. joke. Yeah. yeah. I, Here, I, John, I, let me help you win, fucker. But I would, one joke, Matt was married for about 30 seconds in 2010. And then. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> turns out, yeah, he was m- married longer than he lasts in bed, whatever the joke is. Then the next one is uh, his wife sent him this dance video. And then you can, mm-hmm. I don't know, yeah. go from there. I, w- I might try to break that up. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Like you, you, you do it quick. You do it confident. That's the other thing: is the less words you have, a lot of times you make, it's the more confident the delivery is, because people can tell that you've taken the time to edit it. You know, and like yeah. think about it like this: whenever there's turbulence on a flight, it's like turbulence in the room when you're doing comedy. And what's the first thing you do? If a pilot tells you, "Hey, there's going to be turbulence," and then you feel turbulence, you're not worried. But if nobody says anything and it's unexpected, the first yeah. thing you do is you look at the face of the airline attendants. And they go, if they look nervous, I get nervous. If they're running for the fucking seatbelts. Exactly. If they're running, if they look panicked, if they look calm, I'm cool. Bring me a cookie. And I know this turbulence is is not unexpected. It's not a surprise. It's something they were expecting. Because at the end of the day, what you're doing from that stage is leading the audience emotionally. So if you're calm and cool, and if you're a a good sport about the joke, there's no reason why the show wouldn't go great. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, you, yeah. I was uh, maybe explain this to my therapist this this morning. <laughs> like you know, the only way to win is to not be bothered by any of it. Well, Don't listen, let it hit home. It's Don't not let a it. Sport. You know. It's it's. I mean, it's the one funny thing about roast that I. Uh, it's the one element that always hits me funny is comedy is art. It's not sport. Yeah. Right. Like in art, you're like, oh, it's my job to try to be the best. In in, I'm sorry, in sport, you're like, I want to be the best. But in art, it's I want to be the only. 
And that's a completely different energy. It's more internal. So really roast battles in my perspective, yeah, you want to win and there's that competitive energy that you want in there for the energy of roast battle. But at the end of the day, from an artistic perspective, if you help him write a joke that roasts you, you're part of the artistic outcome. And yeah. that, that's a good thing. Yeah. You're it's, welcome, John. It's still a show, that's right? Like, like, yeah, it, that's it, a thing it, that it, I think people forget here in Barcelona quite a bit. You're putting on a show. This is entertainment. You need to be big and like, I yeah. don't know, showman-ish. Be confident in what you're saying. Yeah. And show them that you thought about it so that you've earned their attention. People are paying money to come. Uh, the only thing, the only time I get upset at comics is when they go on stage and I can tell they didn't write anything. Mm. They didn't write anything. And it's, it's not, I don't, I get upset on the behalf, on behalf of the audience. Mm. Like they paid money. They're giving you their time. They're, they're coming to watch you perform. The thing you owe them is for this gift that you get to have people applaud for you is to take some time to really be thoughtful. And one of my other things is like, cause you mentioned this thing that was great, which is, oh, um, he was married for 10 seconds. That's how long he lasts in bed. It, it, I always write down, that was my first. And then I go, that's the one to beat. The uh, first idea you thought of is also the first idea the audience thought of. So they'll laugh. But if you want to get a big laugh, you got to keep digging and digging and digging and go. And subvert that somehow. And make it, and it, the more of a, the beginning of every joke is a distraction and the back of every joke is a surprise. The bigger the surprise, the bigger the laugh. Yeah. Mm. That just, that made me think of, so uh, at Edinburgh Festival last year, I, I was lucky enough to, to do two roasts. And one was against Stuart Kennedy, who's a comedian from here. We know each other relatively well. We had time to talk about it, et cetera. But then they were like, oh, do you want to do another one? Uh, and I said, yeah. And then they just paired me with a random comedian. And I hadn't ever heard of this person. Um, they were called Sam. They were just a comedian from Liverpool. And, and the only way we had to exchange anything, there was no time to meet up. So it was like, we just emailed each other 10 facts. Now, Sam sent me their 10 facts and it was almost too much. It was like, uh, I, I'm like bisexual, I'm uh, not transgender, I, uh, I can't remember the one where, their, their pronouns are they, them. Queer. Um, they're queer. Yeah, well, they're, they're a queer comedian. Uh, their father used to beat them. Um, all this, all this like really heavy stuff. And I'm like, um, I got divorced and I went to private school and I'm Jewish. Like I, I didn't have all of this additional. I felt bad, but we had to exchange these jokes. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't know anything about the person. But what I tried to do was almost not go for the easy target, right? Because the the climate it would have been really easy to make a joke about transgender or or, or the fact that I think they said they're autistic and all this. Mm -hmm. But they're also from Liverpool in the UK. Like a lot of people, that Liverpool has a reputation. So I, I. I can't remember how I word it exactly, but I, I said, this is Sam. And I listed all those things. They're transgender. They're, this is Sam from Liverpool. They're transgender. They're autistic and, uh, and, and has learning diff difficulties. Like how the hell do you get through the day knowing you're from Liverpool? So it's That's like, do you know, yeah. So yeah. it's like they all expected me to make the obvious joke sure. about that. But I was just like, no, I'm just taking the piss about coming from Liverpool. Yeah. So like sometimes you, if you subvert their expectations, like you were saying, yeah. and it's a bigger surprise, it's a, and it's actually not as nasty as they thought it was going to be yeah, either. Yeah, like it gets a big laugh. It's huge. That's how you get fans. It, a lot of it, the funny thing is, people don't realize this. Like a lot of comedians become famous from one joke, mm -hmm. one, and then that. And but it's a joke that isn't just a joke. It's a joke that's only you could do. You know the way Louis talked about his kids, the way Angela Johnson talked about the fingernail salon. Ali Wong. Uh, Ali Wong talking about her husband. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or when she was pregnant, Pockets. Cobra Mom. Like there's always like, and the way to get to those jokes is to write and write and write. You know, even if you're doing it in your head, that's okay. That's mm -hmm. still writing. But people can tell when you haven't spent time on thinking thinking through a joke. And this idea that you're just going to go up and it's going to happen. Oof, those are rough, rough. Rough. And you're throwing away an opportunity too. It's not just about the night. Yeah. You're throwing away the potential to be on this network. I mean, I had one video go viral, but I had a bunch of videos and that one video going viral made people find my other videos and my, it completely changed my business. Mm -hmm. Like now I have a pretty good following on social media. And now when I gig all around Europe, I have people who come and pay money for tickets. So this is, it's not just a show. It's a huge opp opportunity. No pressure yeah. though. No, it's not, pre but you're, that's the beautiful, the beauty of it is you can't write with pressure. You got to have, have fun, but just spend, spend time. I mean, that have fun is, it's gotta be like the number one rule. Yeah, I agree. This place, man. Like, yeah. 
I mean, it's the difference between a bad first timer set and a good first timer set. Is 100%. Whether or not the kid just enjoyed it. Yeah. Very easy to lose as well. When yeah. You're caught up and yeah. trying to sell yeah. tickets and trying to do this or whatever. That's always the. We're quite prescriptive with the show. Those who have done it will know. Like, we send a big long message to the group at the beginning. Like, here's the rules. Here's what we expect. We brief people for the purge events. We take them in the green room. We do like a pre-show briefing, like very professional. But the absolute last thing we always say is, please just have as much fun as you can. Like 100%. enjoy it. You're on stage. You're being mean to each other. The audience is like, wants this, just have fun. And what Tamara said, like the more they laugh at each other's jokes, like the more the energy in the room increases, the audience relaxes. Yeah. It's so important. Even if you're losing, even if they're battering you and your jokes aren't working, still enjoy the fact that they're making these brilliant jokes about you, which maybe you can take on and use in your own stuff. You know, when you come on stage, I know what you're thinking, guys. Yeah. I look like, the, you know, you could take one of that if they, if they don't mind you doing it. Yeah. That now you have all this material you can use, even if you've lost badly. For so sure. like it's just a massive it's really good fun. Yeah. It's a compliment as well. If somebody's found out that they're up against you and they've said, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna spend the next three days exactly. sitting down yeah. trying to figure out exactly how I'm gonna take your part, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hundred percent. And I think it's I wait. Think it's should I a... be offended then that John hasn't written anything about me yet? <laughs> yeah, I've written too much stuff. I've got too many things. I'm just yeah. having to narrow it down is the uh, the tricky thing at the moment. Dude, it's it's such a valuable uh, skill set to gain, which is just like having stuff not bother you like that. And a hundred percent. It's great. It's a great thing to for the comedy community to embrace, and it's a great thing for the comedy community to like kind of teach normal people about. Like, yeah, eh, mm -hmm. big deal. I've been quite surprised. Some, sometimes it's been quite a struggle to get a lineup for these shows. And I don't know if it's because people are intimidated by at least, I think hopefully by doing it at the clubhouse where it's a bit more stripped back and raw. We want it to be more accessible. We want yeah. newer people just to come and try roasting for the first time as well. Um, there's still there's, there's good, but as much effort and love into these shows as the others. And hopefully they'll be as good. But it, without that big stage and all the lights going off, Sometimes, yeah, I, I feel like people, they might be intimidated by doing sure. it because um, yeah. of that. And also, yeah, this this idea of like going up there and being vulnerable and not necessarily knowing how to write it. Yeah, I think like, a lot we, of people are afraid of being mean, too. Yeah. I know that's oh, yeah, held hugely. me back. Like, I don't want, you know, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't want to go up there and make but fun it, of Mariah or whoever. I think that's yeah. the, that's the mis, um, that's the misconception is yeah. that it, it, it's, it's mean. Is it a stunt? That's that, mean. Oh, okay. I just unplugged something out with my foot. Oh, okay. Because yeah. it's not mean. It's like, you know, when you see animals play fighting in the jungle, they're not being mean to each other. They're playing with each other. They're showing each other's bellies. And, and in a situation where if they show their bellies with a predator, they'd be dead. Yeah. But with each other, they're like, yeah, come. It come, tickles. Come at me. Teach me. Teach me how to be durable. And say a terrible thing to me. And every time I've roast battled anyone, our relationship has gotten tighter. We become better friends because that's that that's what it means to be a human being to have someone say look at all these terrible things about you and i still love you and you're awesome that is the dude I, i'll tell you i'm married now and i wasn't married for a long time when i met someone who says i know every shitty thing about you and i still love you that was the first time i felt loved Oof. in my whole life well i mean that's like the definition in my opinion that's the definition of love yeah. that's that's unconditional love i know 100%. your flaws and i love you anyway 100 percent um yeah. I like how deep this got. We were like, how to write jokes. Now it's like the definition That's of love. Tamar. We That's, just figured it out. is a <laughs> philosopher <laughs> in a comedian's uh, I, penis. I've been living know. with Tamar for like, what, a couple of months now? Yeah. And like this man's ability to find a, an, a perfect analogy for anything <laughs> yeah. is so yeah. inspiring. I'm like, damn, I wish I was that smart. Yeah. Well, there's, there's some of it that's not deep, like where you can, there's some really playful side of it too. Like you guys know Nick DiPaolo, yep. who's known as being the meanest Red, yeah. you know, uh, right wing comic and all this stuff. But Nick DiPaolo is phenomenal at finding silly sounding words. And there's a lot to be said for that, too. Like Nick DiPaolo said this joke about, oh, I was walking the street in New York. I saw a homeless guy on the ground. It just made me feel bad. I'm at home sleeping on an eight hundred dollar mattress. And this guy's sleeping on a Heineken. <laughs> And the word Heineken was so fucking funny. Like, and, and that's there's certain words, and it could be that too. It doesn't have to be deep. It could be just silly and playful. And I think that's, that's the word, ironically, um, Woody Allen, that's the word he would say on his way to the stage. He'd say, play. Really? Yeah, he would, that was his mantra on the way to the stage. He'd say, play. Um, I heard the other day Lauren Michaels saying, the most important thing is that whoever's watching your stuff 
go, gee, looks like they're having fun. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so, I mean, that's, I, I think that'll be my struggle for Thursday. But let's try to, because we're, we're kind of wrapping up on time. Let's try to re, I don't know, what is it when you uh, summarize? Summari- yeah. Summarize the, the re- re- recap? Yeah, yeah, kind of. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, like, basically, we didn't get to into, we didn't write too many jokes together. But the, the first one is to identify your premises, not necessarily with things that are going to hurt them, but things that are personal and that would make the, the joke unique and surprising, right? And then from there, you take your first thought and then you try to one up that shit times 10. Premise is so important. I think people, that, that's one of the biggest mistakes people make is I think premise gets their attention and then punchline is the funny. Like I have this great example of like a joke where I knew not everyone in the room knew what it was like to be an immigrant. And I was like, oh, I moved from Egypt to America. And I was explaining how moving from Egypt to America is not the same as moving from Illinois to California. So I, had to, I came up with a metaphor to make the audience feel what I feel, even though there's no way they'd know it. And I said, moving from Egypt to America was like moving to the future. And as soon as I said that, the room went silent. And they were, and I could literally feel people leaning in. Mm. Like they were intrigued. That's the job of a premise, is to make people go, ooh, and then, and even have them come up with an expectation. And then you've got punchline, 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 tag, tag, tag. Yeah. You know. With this, uh, uh, two questions real quick about the roast. Tags, tags and notes. Mm. A, are notes okay? We, we don't say don't bring notes. And I think Thomas said it earlier. Like, I, I, my fucking short term memory at the moment is terrible. So I need prompts, but don't read it like a script. It's just, uh, yeah, it's there answer. to be like, okay, that's my next joke. Mm-hmm. Like, John remind myself. Alice is a big dumb, doomy head, dummy head. Yeah. Big dummy head. And then in terms of tags, I mean, yeah, do tags, but we've had uh, some people on the roast where like they do a punchline and it's worked. And then they've done like three or four like additional tags that almost some of them even go into like being a whole new joke. Yeah. And it's like, ah, oh, just mm, let's stop there. Cause yeah. then also, you know, we then have to kind of maybe edit those out for the yeah. clips. It's kind of annoying. But even for the audience, it's like, tell your joke, hear the crowd, and then next person. Just keep yeah. keep it keep, going. Back yeah. I mean that my my fear was being too short. And just had you know. So here's an example that I saw on my phone. Uh and the line it's just John thinks Me Too is an invitation. That's the whole thing. Is it what? Invitation. Invitation. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think it needs more. It, that needs a bit more. Does, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Fuck. Because, <laughs> what, because uh, yeah, you need, like, that's almost like the punchline. But now yeah. you need the premise. And so I would, it, you could save it. Because sometimes that happens. Sometimes you go, oh, that could be a great punchline. And you just put it to the side. But now you got to build from like i had this yeah. joke about a, i had a cousin who had a who saw um elon musk on tv and he's like fucking loser and i'm like you're unemployed and you <laughs> literally have a salsa stand on your shirt yeah. mm-hmm. like and then so i was like oh that's kind of funny that he has a salt and then i and then i built on it and i'm like oh elon musk took a car to the moon on top of a spaceship brought it back and drove it away you couldn't get salsa from a bowl <laughs> to your lips mm. And then that started working. And then I'm like, what's the premise? And then I came up with this premise. Uh, this is the golden age of stupid people. Uh, Isn't yeah. it amazing how confident stupid people are? Yeah. That was it. There's no penalty for them right now. And then as soon as I said stupid That's... people are confident, then that set up the joke. The, that premise made the joke better. Kids, if you're listening, wa- go, rewind it right now and watch how Tamra writes this. Because he, he had a concept, then he found the punchline, and then he went back and rewrote the premise. Yeah, that yeah. could happen. And now it fucking kills. I think, uh, I'll, I'll tell you guys that personally, I can make a, a, a thousand punchlines, but what I'm real shit at, or I don't put a lot of effort in right now is the rewriting and going back and yeah. just fucking grinding the yeah. joke into something better. It's the like premises... planning for gold, right? It's just yeah. like sifting it all Yeah, out but me. then you have to melt it down and make a bigger <laughs> gold nugget. And it, It's you know. easier to write when you're writing a premise because you don't have to be funny in a premise. You just have to be mm. thoughtful. Yeah. And that's, that is what really turns comedians into writers. That's what made people like Robin Williams go from comedy to an amazing actor. There's so many comedians who are phenomenal actors because they're just, they've studied human beings, you know? They're way sensitive. I think that sensitivity is... Yeah. Just, um, to, just to go, sorry, John, just to go back to your point about like, can it be too short? I think that specific example needed like maybe a few extra words. But I think with some comedians, they think like I'm, they forget that I'm on, I'm on stage I want my stage time, so I'm gonna 
try and drag out the jokes I'm on stage longer. I don't know if that's a conscious thing or a subconscious thing. Whereas if you can get up there and do like five like snappy jokes, other person's five, and the roast is over within three minutes. That's yeah. how it was in Edinburgh. They were doing like five or six a night. There's no time to fuck around because there's a show before and after. And you were just on and off. And, and yeah. like, that was it. You don't have to be like, I'm here. I have to do a whole 10 sure. minute yeah. performance. But, like that joke requires, I think you could make lists, right? Like, um, the meat, I would write a list for me too. And then I would write a mm -hmm. list for things that John does that you think John does. And then you could find matching things like Earl Sakel did this roast battle against Jamie Carr, who was a beast, but Earl Sakel was our LA beast. And he goes, uh, Jamie Carr, uh, looks not only looks like he dresses, uh, for Hogwarts, uh, it's what he gives women who sleeps with him. <laughs> So he found, and it's like, oh, yeah. there's Hogwarts, and then, oh, se he has sex with women. Oh, warts. And then warts translate up. So yeah. I think with the Me Too movie, you could even be like autism. Autism is see things backwards. Uh, uh, John is uh, has a weird form of autism where he sees everything backwards, and that's why he thinks Me Too is an invitation. You yeah. know what I mean? So you could do stuff like that where you just keep going, yeah, write going, that going. One down real quick. <laughs> You know, yeah, I mean, that's just that's annoyingly the similar head. to a joke I've written. <laughs> for, for oh, that's right. Yeah, sorry. And, uh, I'm, uh, I think I might go in a slightly different direction anyway. Yeah. So. But you get it. As, as long as it connects, you can really surprise people by lists are really fun. Yeah. You know, you could make lists and then start seeing matching things. We're like, oh, no way. Oh, and it's the surprising great. things that are really. 100%. Yeah. yeah that's the, um, that's the, the toy in the Happy Meal box. Yeah. Um, I had a question about theme because obviously sometimes it seems to, to to pay off very well to have all five of your jokes kind of run along the same theme like the example you get before james about the, the the girl being racist or whatever i know jay uh sorry andy did a, a, a good roast at almeria where everything was on the same theme mm. um but then before this podcast we were talking about jokes they can't all be the same they can't all be repetitive so they have to kind of be different so what's your feeling on because i considered with matt telling all my jokes about the same basic uh theme do you think that's just basic high risk high risk potentially high reward or, or how do you feel about that that's an interesting question because the, yeah the examples you so like for instance andy as well the last battle he did against olga he he had he, he said that she looked like a camel but she's also attractive and he liked to have sex with her mm -hmm. and then he did like two or three other jokes afterwards it was like oh when olga has camel toe it's just because she's wearing sandals or something and he you kept bringing this camel theme, but at the same time, each joke on its own kind of felt fresh. Mm -hmm. Whereas my battle against Chris, which to be honest, I, I thought he might win because his jokes were amazing. But you guys were like, you were right. He, he did, nearly every single one was like, James's divorce, his wife, his wife left him. Yeah. Here's a joke directly about that. Which was also the obvious thing, which we've, we've discussed already. That was, that yeah. was the first premise that he that he wrote and then it ended up being all five of his his premises presumably yeah in this situation i don't know Tom, what, do you, what do you think like, yeah no i think i think you always have to think from the perspective of the audience you know like not necessarily what they they're going to tell us is funny but what they um in, in knowing that they the limited amount of knowledge i think if you like um uh, it depends it depends on the room there's going to be jokes that are like more safe to do that they're, they're going to hit the punch on every single time and then there's going to be jokes where if olga had better roast jokes maybe the camel jokes would have stopped working sure do you know mm -hmm. what i mean mm -hmm. like um you know or if she'd done roast battle longer she could be like uh you know a, a comeback uh, the comebacks are really powerful you know where you could cut someone off of the knees you could be like like if i was olga and he did that to me i'd be like okay can't wait to the next three jokes you've written about camels and he's like, uh, uh. Yeah, that yeah, would have yeah, fucked yeah. him. Fucked completely him. Completely puts Com a stop in it. Completely fucked him. But also, I've had people do... You, I had someone who beat me in roast just because of one thing that he did. It wasn't the jokes that he wrote. He would have these little one-liners in between. Thank you, Persian Joe Rogan. And I'm like, oh, you fucker. Nice. And then the audience exploded. Because yeah. I do look like a Persian Joe Rogan. Yeah. So those observational one-liners, the camel things, if he made it as a thank you every time she ripped on him, if he was like... Uh, thank you, Joe Camel. You know, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. you know things like that. Then there's a way to do it. A, a guy in London got me with something similar to what you just said. So I feel like my actual jokes were better. So he did two things. First of all, he kept, but his rebuttals were all like stupid, like your mum jokes, which are dumb, but the audience really liked it. But the other thing that he got me with before every joke, he just went. The first one was quite normal. He said, "This guy's this is James Regal," but then each time he like, "No, on seriously, guys, this." 
this is James Regal. <laughs> You know, and then if he sounded disappointing, one like, oh, I guess this is James Regal. Before every joke, and every time he did it, it got funnier and funnier. And it was just, I couldn't, I yeah. couldn't beat that because, yeah. like, didn't well, matter could. how good it. You could have beat it. Well, yeah, okay. In hindsight, if you were prepared, but now but I wasn't ready for that. I bet you, if it happened again, you'd destroy him. Yeah, yeah. Because it's the same. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. But there's also a lot of a lot of power to being said in like j people just having a good time, just having fun. I think the power of those jokes wasn't even him repeating James Rule, but it was how he delivered it, right? The yeah, exactly. It, how it impacted you, maybe like your reaction to it. You know, I, I think that's a that's a huge part of it is just just having fun. Well, you heard it here first, folks. Have some motherfucking fun. <laughs> yeah, let's have fun, man. Let's do it. I will try my very best. All right, guys. I wanna I wanna wrap this up. So identify personal premises. Right, right, right. Have and fun. Edit, edit. Take out any unnecessary words. Mm -hmm. Make sure it's logical, that it makes sense. Run it by other comedians. Talk to comedians in the scene and be like, hey, uh, here are my roast battle jokes. Does this make sense to you? Not, don't ask them if it's funny. Just go, does this make sense? And, and be open for the feedback. Mm. You know, don't just ask people in hopes that they're going to say, oh, everything's great. Like, just go, no, I, w I want your feedback. I want to make sure these jokes are... Tight. I shouldn't have asked him anyway. <laughs> I mean, he, what does he know, man? <laughs> yeah.